Hey, what's up everybody? In this video, we're going to go over space complexity and some common mistakes that people make with Big O. So to understand space complexity, we'll take this function into consideration. And this is a recursive function that basically just returns a call to itself with its input in minus one. And it's going to do this until we reach a base case where n equals zero. And then it's going to just return and at that point this function will be complete. So let's go ahead and draw out what the execution of this function would look like. So let's say that we pass the number five to this countdown function. So with this first call to countdown with our argument five, we'll end up at this base case and we'll see that our n5 is not equal to zero. So we'll move on to this part of the code, which is just calling this function again with five minus one. And of course, five minus one is going to be four. And once again, we'll end up here and we'll call the function again with four minus one. And we'll continue to do this until we pass a zero as our end to the function. And I will need to make this a little bit smaller. And finally, we get to the call where we're passing zero as our n to the function. Now at this point, if n is equal to zero, the function will just return. So to understand space complexity, it's actually quite simple. So since this is a recursive function, each one of these calls exists on the call stack simultaneously. So that means that if we call our countdown function with five, it's going to then call itself with four. And at this point, this initial call still exists on the call stack. And the same for when we call three, these two calls still exist on the call stack. And all the way down until we reach our base case, every single one of these calls still exists on the call stack. And each one of these calls takes up memory. So each one of these calls existing on the stack, they take up memory. And this is how we come to an understanding of space complexity using this recursive function as an example, because if we're returning at this point when we reach our base case, that means that, that, means that we have one, two, three, four, five, five calls taking up space on our call stack. And five also happens to be our value for n. So that would mean that this function, its space complexity is O of n. So this function has a space complexity of O of n. So the most important thing to remember here is that all of these recursive calls exist on the call stack simultaneously, and each one of them takes up memory, which is why if we have, if we pass in five to, as our n, we'll have five calls existing in memory simultaneously, which means that our space complexity is going to be O of n. It's going to scale linearly with the size of the input. So if we increase the size of this input, the space required to execute this function is going to scale proportionally with the size of this input. Hey, just one quick interruption. If you are finding this video helpful or it's bringing you to some type of understanding, please take the time to like and subscribe. So now that we have an understanding of space complexity, we can get into some common mistakes that people make with big O. And the first one being that when you first start out with big O, you might see a function that looks like this that has two for loops, and you might instinctively assume that this function is of O of n square time complexity, because you see that there are two for loops here, so that must mean that it's O of n square. But actually, as we've learned, O of n square actually means that for each iteration up until the size of our input, we're going to iterate all the way through an additional for loop up until the size of our input. So what does it mean if we have two for loops that aren't nested, that aren't O of n square? It's actually quite simple. So we have one for loop here, and we have another for loop here. and as we already know, 
this for loop would be O of n time complexity. And this one would also be O of n. So at this point, we have two O of n's. So that could easily be translated to O of 2n, which is just O of 2 times n. So 2 times we have O of n. But if we remember from our previous lessons, we ignore constants. And in this case, multiplying n by 2, 2 is just a constant. So we can actually just drop this constant, in which case this just becomes O of n. But there's one important thing that we need to recognize here. This is O of n because we're iterating through the same input for both of these for loops. So as long as our loops are acting on the same input, then this would be the resulting complexity. But there's actually another common mistake that people make when taking time complexity into consideration, which is somewhat related to this mistake. And this common mistake involves having two separate inputs to the function. So let's first take this two inputs add function into consideration. So if you remember from our last example, we only had an input, we only had one input, which was a, and the two for loops looped through that same input. But for this one, you can see that we have two separate inputs here. So we have an input a, which is looped through in this top for loop, and we have an input b, which is looped through in this second for loop. And some people might make the mistake of thinking that this is the same as the last situation where the result would be O of 2n. But this is actually wrong. Because in this particular situation, we have no way of knowing the difference in size of both of these inputs. Like, all we know is that these are two separate inputs. So these two separate inputs could be of either completely different sizes, or they could be of the same size. But from our analysis perspective, we have no idea. So in this situation, when we have two inputs and we have a separate for loop for each input, we're going to need to keep track of both of the inputs. So in this case, the time that it would take to loop through both of these for loops is O of A plus B, because we need to first loop through this one up until we reach the value of A, and then we need to loop through this one up until we reach the value of, v, of b. And at this point, this can't be simplified any further. We need to acknowledge the fact that both of these inputs are separate inputs. So this would be O of a plus b. And here we have a similar situation where we have two inputs, but this time the for loops are nested. And a lot of people make the mistake of saying that this a function that looks like this is O of n squared but that would actually be wrong as well. Because what does O of n square mean? O of n square means that for every iteration of one input, we're going to iterate through that same exact input. But in this situation, when we have, a, when we have two separate inputs, for every iteration of one of the inputs, we're going to iterate through the other input. So what that means is this is wrong. In actuality, it's O of a times b. Because again, we need to specify that these are two different inputs. And these inputs could be of different sizes. And we need to make that visible when we take our complexity into consideration. So that is space complexity and some common mistakes that people make with big O notation. I hope that that makes sense.